Um, I remember walking over and kind of feeling, you know, a little lightheaded. <laughs> and, and I remember seeing her and we said, oh, uh, I think she was thinking the same thing. And she'll, she's told me that. And she's like, oh, here we go. I got to find somebody to pray with. And there he is. I got to pray with this guy. And we locked hands. And to be honest with you, this is crazy. You know, maybe it was my flesh. I, I really believe it was God. We locked hands. And I felt like a, a jolt through my hands, tingly all over my body. <laughs> maybe it was the flesh. I, but I felt tingly all over. And, uh, and I felt like I heard in my spirit the Lord say, this is your wife. Now, I would have said that was all flesh if my wife years after we were married and I brought that situation up she said act to be honest with you that's the exact same thing I thought in that exact same moment the Lord said this is your husband well last week I started uh, sharing my testimony and I really typically break it up into two parts one being uh, my first teen challenge stint and my second Teen Challenge stint. And so I think that's just the easy way to, to kind of block it off and be able to address two different lives for me. So last week, really going into my younger years, uh, my upbringing in, in faith and my um, embracing of that in early years and then my rejection of that in, in later years um, in pursuit of worldly things, in pursuit of... Oh, happiness, I guess, and satisfying the, the lusts of the flesh, flesh and the exploration of a teenager and kind of that life. I came in at the age of 18 into Teen Challenge, and I turned 19 in the program. So I talked about that last week and kind of walked you through that, so I won't linger there very long. Well, I graduated this program um, in 1997, so I came in in 1996, graduated high school in 95, came to Teen Challenge in 96, and completed in, in 97. And so that was really my, my first experience with Teen Challenge, and I would say my first real experience with Jesus, I guess. I, I had an upbringing in faith, and I'm not saying that that wasn't real, but it got more real as, as a young man embracing Christ and having um, tasted of the things of the world and then rejected the world and, and clung to Christ in my first program here. Well, I completed this program and, man, I fell in love with God here. I fell in love with the message of Jesus, the true message of Jesus, the revolutionary message of Christ. And it was here that I started to testify on services. <coughs> I was asked to get up on many occasions and share in front of people. I never liked getting up in front of people. It's never been, I still not real fond of it, uh, although I'm called to do it. I uh, have a little bit of stage fright. I don't like getting up in front of people. At least in the past, it was crippling. I mean, when I was younger, it was crippling. So, so much so that if I were asked to stand up and share my name, age, where I was from, and my hobbies on the first day of school, I would freeze up. Like my heart beating out of my chest, I started to get clammy and started sweating just because I didn't like speaking in front of people. Um, but in Teen Challenge, I started to share on, on services and in testimonies, same kind of thing, man. I was scared to death, but, but really began to start to walk in that and sharing my testimony and, and really felt a call on my life to, to share what God had done in my life. And so in Teen Challenge, that kind of cultivated that. Um, really never preached except for toward the end of my program. I got to preach one time. That's, we still do that to this day. Back then, we would give you guys and, and myself an opportunity to speak at the end of your program and share a sermon. And so I, I remember sharing my first ever sermon um, at the end of my program in 97, having testified at churches all through that year and felt a call in my life to go into ministry. So I had an opportunity to go do an internship in Oklahoma City with my, my uncle, Pastor Greg Whitlow. He pastored one of the largest churches in Oklahoma City. He's the one that flew, I'm pretty sure, I'm speculating here, but I'm pretty sure he's the one that flew Bill Everett down to see me. Bill Everett's the founder of this ministry, down to speak to the judge in Hot Sulphur Springs, Colorado, on my behalf. 
So I went there to that church to do an internship, and I worked with the youth. I got to share in youth on a couple of occasions and preach, and I got to do bus ministry. We would go into the inner cities and, and invite kids to church, and, and so I did that for you know, probably about a year where maybe a little less, but uh, where we were bringing kids to church and, and to the youth group. And the youth group was pretty big back then. So um, that was kind of my first, you know, teen challenge part of ministry and testifying and preaching and then going into um, internship in Oklahoma City. And so from there, I talked to another uncle who was in Louisiana. I was trying to figure out how I was going to afford Bible college and if you're not familiar uh, with Bible College, Bible College can be pretty expensive. Um, some schools like Southwestern Assembly of God in, in Waxahachie, Texas is, is really expensive. Um, to be honest with you, they're almost ex as expensive as some Ivy League schools like Princeton, Harvard, and Yale, um, which is crazy to me. You know, you're training for a ministry that you're going to make about, you know, maybe 30000 60000 a year if you're lucky. And you're going to be, you know, 100K in debt by the time you finish college. Well, I grew up on the other side of the tracks. My family had no money for me for school. I didn't get any scholarships because I wasn't top of the class um, in high school. I had no money to show for it. So I was looking for an opportunity to go to school where I could afford it. And a few of my friends who were a little bit more affluent got to go to Southwestern in, in Texas. Well, there was an opportunity in New Orleans to go to school. And my uncle, uh, Tony, Tony uh, Schreffler, he got me in there and told me he was going to get me a job. Well, I remember getting to, to New Orleans. I didn't know anybody. I hardly even knew my uncle Tony. And um, we met at Dairy Queen where he was going to share with me what my new job was. Well, I walked into Dairy Queen in Mandeville. Is that Mandeville? I think yes. Mandeville, Louisiana. And I sit down and I'm talking with Tony and Tony shares with me that my first job here is going to be right here at Dairy Queen. Um, I don't know what it was, man. I always like mowed yards and worked in landscape and uh, got my hands dirty, worked some more, more hard manual labor um, as, as a young man. So working at Dairy Queen felt like, like a kick in the gut to me. I didn't want to work in fast food, um, nothing against it. I was just prideful and arrogant and I didn't want to work at Dairy Queen. And I remember him telling me that, like, oh, man. So here I'm in a, in a foreign land. It felt like I don't know anybody. Um, here's this uncle I barely even know, and I'm going to get a job at Dairy Queen to pay my way through Bible college. Um, it wasn't exactly what I wanted to hear. Well, I worked faithfully at Dairy Queen for a while. That's how I paid my way through school and, and Bible college there. New Orleans School of Urban Missions was not a normal school. Nor New Orleans School of Urban Missions, SUM for short, um, was... A school that believed that you, if, you, if you spent 50% of your time in the classroom, you should spend 50% of your time on the streets applying what you learned in the classroom. And so they had what they called practicum hours, which meant that um, you would pick a practicum in New Orleans, um, in the Fisher Project, in the Iberville, in the Calio, some of the um, projects made famous by um, early gangster rap. These, these rough places in New Orleans. Um, at that time, New Orleans led the uh, murder rate per capita in, in, the, in the nation. Um, this is pre-Katrina. This is before Hurricane Katrina came in and kind of clean sweeped New Orleans. It was a violent place. When they killed people, they didn't bury them. They left them on the street. Um, it was a rough, rough place. Well, we were engaged in those bad neighborhoods, man. The Fisher Projects was the largest um, project in New Orleans, and that's where I ministered. Um, my wife ministered, um, wasn't my wife at the time, but my soon-to-be wife ministered um, in the Poppies Projects. And, um, and these were violent, violent places, man. It wasn't what I was used to, but to be honest with you, I kind of thrived in that place because I come from, I'm not saying I was a gangster, or even trying to purport that. Um, but I grew up in the lifestyle of drug addiction, and it puts you in contact with some nefarious characters. Um, just look around you. We are the nefarious characters of drug addiction. And I, so I kind of thrived in that place. I loved it, man. I didn't fit, feel right in Bible college, maybe in some place like um, Waxahachie, Texas, 
where everybody seemed to be perfect, I, I fit in and I, I love the concept of what the School of Urban Missions stood for. And so, man, in the School of Urban Missions, we learned in the classroom and then we went out on the streets and we knocked on doors and we told people about Jesus. In the Fisher, man, it, it was crazy to me because in Oklahoma, you hid your drug addiction and your drug selling. In the Fisher, they own that neighborhood. They're, it's an open crack market. You know, you're walking by, they, they look at me and they just go on to selling crack with all of them in their hands as they're just distributing them on the streets. I can remember at times ministering to those same crack dealers and telling them about Jesus. Um, there was actually something that uh, the leadership at the Bible College would inform us and instruct us on when going to these projects. They would say, as soon as you hear gunshots, and you will, we will, we'll, this is our safe place. This is where we report back to. And on many of occasions, gunshot would ring out and we would meet back at one location and then we would leave the projects. Um, because typically if there's gunshots at one moment, gunshots are coming later um, in, in these neighborhoods. So that's, that's the Fisher Projects. That's some of these places we ministered at. I loved it, man. I loved being front line, ministering to individuals. We led people to the Lord. We started Bible studies in some of these project, project house, housing um, units and saw some pretty, pretty cool things. Well, my wife, not at the time, but Jessica, was at the Poppy Street Outreach, and on one occasion, she is going door to door and inviting people to church, inviting them to the tent crusade. We'd set up a, set up a big tent, have music, um, people would sing, and people would preach, and we would invite people. Well, she gets up to somebody's door one day and knocks on the door, and this guy named Treetop comes to the door. Well, Treetop looks at her, cocks his Glock, puts it to her head and says, what are you doing in my neighborhood, white girl? And she says, well, um, and at this point, the guy that was with, there, with her, I forgot his name, I think it was Jonathan, uh, skinny white boy, <laughs> saw the gun and he slowly backed away from the door, away from it. So she's standing on this porch with the gun cocked into her temple and, and he says, what are you doing in my neighborhood? And she says, well, I'm I'm here to invite you to the tent crusade where I'll be singing tonight. He says, you sing? She said, yeah, I sing. He said, well, then sing, white girl. And she said, Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me so. So she sings, Jesus loves me. The whole time, he didn't put the gun down and let her sing. The whole time, gun was cocked into her temple. And she sings a little bit more soulful than me. And I'm sure that day as she was singing for her life, she sang real soulful. She sang. She didn't sing. She sang for her life. Well, he uncocked, and then he put the gun and says, Man, you can sing, girl. Well, guess who showed up to the tent crusade that night on the back row of that service treetop listening to what was going on there that day. That's the places we ministered. It was, it was some rough environments. Uh, I remember at one point someone getting stabbed not far from me over a domino game and a bet that was placed on that game. We loved what we did, and to be, to be honest, quickly I became acclimated to that environment. One of my good friends, Joe Rodrostic, is now uh, pastoring a church in Chicago, right in the heart of this, doing, still doing the same things. I watched him last night as he ministered um, with a group of people in the inner city of Chicago. Um, one of my classmates and upperclassmen when I was in school. And so these people went out and did things for the Lord. So me, I started, uh, my pra one of my practicum hours other than the Fisher was to minister at my uncle's church on the weekend. So my uncle's church was called Cornerstone Assembly of God. And my uncle is a, is a great man. Um, he's unique, he's different. But to be honest with you, I learned a lot from my uncle Tony. My Uncle Tony's not somebody I grew up with. It's someone I became acquainted with later in life as you know, I was going through school there. But Tony was the guy who planted churches. And I'm not talking about like how we plant churches today where you go in and one church buys a church and, and you take that name and it's more like expansion. You know, like this church you know, called the um, Life House then plants another Life House and then plants another Life House with all the funding. No, my uncle was a grassroots church planner. He went into neighborhoods with nothing. He knocked on doors. He led people to Jesus. He started Bible studies in houses. And when those Bible studies became too big, he usually bought like some storefront or rented some storefront facility where they would start having church and more and more people would come. Eventually, he would build a church 
and he would build it with his own hands. He was a carpenter. He was the first guy I learned how to do sheetrock from. Um, and he built churches with his own hands. I learned a whole lot from my Uncle Tony. He was, and, or is, he's not, I'm talking about him like he's dead. He's still alive. Um, he is a man of faith and a man of, of action. And so I, I really appreciated getting to see that side of someone who loved people and laid his life down for the gospel. Um, he built the church with a couple of other laborers, and eventually that church got big enough to, to support a youth pastor, and I was their first youth pastor. Um, when I first got to that church, there was one kid. His name was David. Uh, I don't remember his last name. Jared might remember his name. Jared was with me in some of those early years. Um, but this, there was one kid, and he was, he was like ADHD, you know, that was my first Sunday school class. It was me and David. And David um, didn't listen to a word I said. So this is my youth group. One kid, and he's probably on Adderall at the time. Um, I don't know. Sorry, David, if you ever watch this on YouTube. Um, you're the best youth guy I ever had. <laughs> but he, um, that was the only one. So what we do, we did what I knew to do from School of Urban Missions and from Lakeside in Oklahoma City. We started a bus ministry. We got in a bus, and we went door to door, and we invited kids to church. Well, at this time, I have met a girl named Jessica, Jenta, and, um, you know, there was, there was a little bit of spark there. Matter of fact, let me tell you about our first encounter. We're at School of Urban Missions in chapel, and there's this rule that I didn't know about at the time, and it's that you're not suppo supposed to pray with girls. Uh, every once in a while, they would say, okay, everybody find somebody to pray with. And everybody in the room would go to somebody else and you would lock hands with them and you would, you would share your needs and you would pray together over that certain need. Two people would. Well, I was always on the back row. I usually had my hoodie up and I was usually just, you know, observing from the back. Well, I remember always hating that, like having to go find somebody. And it's like when they say, hey, tell your neighbor next to them. They look good today. Amen. And I'm just like, I'm like, no, I'm good. I'm not, I'm not going to do that. Um, and I can remember them one day sharing, hey, find somebody to pray with, lock hands and pray with somebody. And I'm just like, ah, crap, here we go again. So I stand up, look around. Everybody's already locked hands praying with somebody. There's just one person that doesn't have somebody to pray with. Guess who it is? It's Jessica. Well, I had been in Teen Challenge for a year and now in, in, in an internship for, I don't know, maybe seven, eight months. I forget exactly what that was, maybe even close to a year. But I... Um, I hadn't had a whole lot of interaction with the opposite sex at this point, um, besides my life before Christ, and that was a whole different life. Um, knowing how to interact with Christian girls and how to function in that way, you know, I'm 19, I guess maybe 20 at that point almost. Um, I remember walking over and kind of feeling, you know, a little lightheaded. <laughs> and, and I remember seeing her, and we said, uh, I think she was thinking the same thing, and she'll, she's told me that. And she's like, oh, here we go. i got to find somebody to pray with. And there he is. I got to pray with this guy. And we locked hands. And to be honest with you, this is crazy. You know, maybe it was my flesh. I, I really believe it was God. We locked hands, and I felt like a, a jolt through my hands, a tingly all over my body. <laughs> maybe it was the flesh. I don't know. But I felt tingly all over. And, <laughs> and I felt like I heard in my spirit the Lord say, This is your wife. Yeah. I would have said that was all flesh if my wife, years after we were married and I brought that situation up, she said, Act, to be honest with you, that's the exact same thing I thought in that exact same moment. The Lord say, this is your husband. Um, and it was in that moment that, you know, I, I met Jessica. We started to flirt. Um, we started to talk. We used to go down to the levees there. We were not far from the Mississippi, just across the Mississippi from New Orleans and Gretna. And we would go down there and talk, get coffee and hang out. And, um, man, I fell in love with her. And, yeah, it, it eventually became my wife, and all that came true. And so this is New Orleans School of Urban Missions. This is me having graduated Teen Challenge, pursuing a ministry call on my life in the inner city, and really feeling like this is something I want to do with the rest of my life as a minister. And, and, and so at Cornerstone in Mandeville, the youth group started to grow. Matter of fact, we started the bus ministry. Um, Tony was wise, and he said, you, Lauren, you can't just go around in a van and invite kids to church. That would seem a little weird, maybe. 
especially if you're handing out candy in that said van. Um, hey, kid, you want to go to church? <laughs> uh, so Jessica went with me. So Jessica's part of her practicum hours were to go with me and to invite kids to church. And so we would get in the van and we would go just a little ways away from the church and we'd start knocking on doors, man. That's where we met Will and Scotty. And Will and Scotty became a part of the youth group. It was in a, an area that was a little lower income. Uh, we found Paul DeMarco. Paul is, was our craziest youth kid. He's the kid that mooned people on, on church conferences when we were going to youth crusades. Um, people would pull me over and follow me and say, hey, uh, this kid just showed me his bare butt in the car. You know, these were the kind of kids we were ministering to and bringing to church. And, man, that youth group really exploded, having one kid in it to exploding to, you know, van ministry. We're running a couple vans. Um, would set up little skate things outside and, and skateboard outside and had youth uh, crusades and things like that where we would invite other churches and um, had a little band. And uh, just, yeah, early, early ministry there in, at Cornerstone. Well, my uncle, Tony, um, just was, as was his custom, resign the church. This is what he would do. He would go into communities, just like I said, lead, lead people to the Lord, start Bible studies in homes. Then he would build a church with his own hands with the help of other men. And then he would get that church nice and healthy, and then he would leave it. And we'd go do it again. That was what he did. A selfless minister who gave and who just, just as soon as it was able to pay Pay decent. Just as soon as there was enough money and tithe coming in to live a, a comfortable life, he would hand it off to somebody else. Well, to this day, now his son-in-law is actually still pastoring Cornerstone in that area, and he has churches all over that are still thriving and have grown. Um, now he is truly retired. At that time, he was going to the mission field, and he did. He went to the Philippines. Well, um, I also reti um, didn't retire, but I resigned shortly after, and we sought out employment elsewhere. Well, we, there was a church <coughs> called Highway Tabernacle just outside of Houston in a, in a town called Tarkington where we had the opportunity to go minister. Um, and so we took it. And this youth group you know, probably had about 30 kids in it when we got there. A bunch of church kids, all been in church their entire lives, didn't want to be there. Um, and God did something really, really cool there. Is that, that youth group kind of exploded. We did the same thing, bus ministry. We're running two and three buses at times bringing in the roughest of the rough, you know, kids that were um, kind of out there. Um, on one occasion, there was a girl, a self-professed witch, who came, um, and we had just finished. This is what we do in our altar calls. We had a gym outside. We had made a cafe. We had made, you know, put up a game room and had foosball and air hockey and game consoles, and we had skate miniature skate stuff we would set up in the gym. We had a basketball area. And so as soon as it came time for altar call, I would usually um, call an altar call and then say anybody else who wants to leave can leave, and they would go out the back and back into the gym and hang out and, and go, do, go play. Um, and then we, we could have an altar call up front for those who really wanted to be there. Well, on one occasion, there was a bunch of kids up in the altar. Um, we were playing worship and, and praying for people, and there was this one girl that was sitting in the back on the left side. I can remember it like it was yesterday. Um, and she was just kind of shaking and, and crying. And I remember praying for everybody up front and eventually walking back there. And as I got close, closer to her, this self-professed witch, um, and I don't know how much of that's true. She probably wasn't a witch at all. She just was probably putting on that front like she was. I don't know. But when I got back closer to her, all I could hear her say is, what have I done? What have I done? What have I done? So she had had this revelation in that time in that altar call that she realized the death of Christ and what that meant and, and what sin meant. Um, at least that's how I perceived that situation that, that night. But that's the kind of interactions we would have. Um, we had, you know, openly lesbian um, girls coming. We had um, homosexual guys coming. We had kids with uh, mohawks and, and shaved heads. And, and it was, I loved it. Uh, that's the way I feel like the ministry of Jesus is supposed to be, reaching to the least, the lost, and the last. I'm not saying we condone any of that. We didn't condone it. We preached the truth. Um, and we had moments where people had impact, impacts on their life. Um, some of those same people I still keep in touch with today. So that's me at this church. Well, let me 
very quickly share with you where it started to go south for me. Because I can now paint a picture of how a Teen Challenge graduate, a youth pastor, an evangelist, a preacher, becomes a crack addict. Well, this is where it starts to turn for me. Well, I was, I was ministering there at that church under a pastor there. Um, just an old-fashioned old type minister. Good guy, just uh, old-fashioned minister. Um, and all of this, and even to some of the board members, all that we were doing, there were holes being put in walls. There was, you know, these kids, the way they acted at church wasn't necessarily Christ-like at all times. I'm pretty sure we had a couple fights break out from time to time. Um, and it didn't sit completely well with everybody at the church. Matter of fact, we even had security guards at some point come and, and kind of monitor <laughs> the youth group and make sure everything was going off well. Um, but there was always this little bit of tension between street kids, if you will, and good old-fashioned, old-timey church people. And there was this clash that would happen at times um, and I'm not trying to demonize them at all. I mean, I, we've all got faults. And um, eventually that clash really got to the pastor. And um, there was a tension between me and him. As this youth pastor was, that was doing all this, and then this old-timey pastor had never seen anything like this in his entire life. And all these kids are coming to church. He normally wouldn't come to church. They were even coming on Sunday mornings sometimes. And um, I think the church wanted them to be instantly sanctified, like they're saved. Now Mohawk's gone, you know, um, everything's perfect. And that's just not the way it works. You know, we believe in, even in that denomination, progressive sanctification, that it takes time and for these things to fall off our lives as we're convicted by the Word and the conviction of the Holy Spirit. So there was this tension there. Well, I had promised the youth group that we were going to uh, buy an air hockey table as part of our um, youth outreach. We had all these games out there, and the kids were giving extra. We were doing fundraising and things, selling brisket in front of Walmart, and doing the things that we would do, car washes. Well, I had approval to purchase an air hockey table. Well, it came time to actually purchase it after we had raised the money, and I came to the pastor and I said, we want to buy the air hockey table now. And he said, no. Well, to this old Teen Challenge guy, that wasn't good enough. To be honest with you, I was angry. And at that point, there was a little bit of tension there, and I felt as if I was doing the true work of the gospel, and he was not. Now, there might be a, a tiny bit of truth to that, in that we're reaching out to the least, the lost, and the last, um, and he seemed to be rejecting that. I'm not here to dissect that today, but I am here to dissect my own heart and what I interacted when I was told no, when I felt like I was doing what was right. So to be honest and completely open with my own struggles, at that point, I was angry, and I said, you, you, know, you promised that you would do this, and he didn't do this. So we had a cafe called Cafe 7, and we sold you know, nachos and, and, and uh, hot dogs and all the things that come in a, in a little roadside cafe like that. And we would sell them to the kids. Well, I started to take a little bit of the money from Cafe 7 and I put it in my desk underneath um, something there in an envelope. And through the next few months, I started collecting all that money and I put it in my desk. And my intention was this, that as soon as we get enough money, I'm going to go buy that air hockey table anyway. I don't care what this pastor says. You know, we, we often find areas where we fall and they're not what you think they would be. It's not like I picked up a prostitute and went to a hotel room and went right back into the same addiction I was in before. It's the small things. It's the little foxes, the Bible says, that spoil the vine. It's the little compromises. And for here, my compromise was to be angry at the man that God had placed over my life to disobey what he said and to do what I wanted to do. Something rose up in me, even if it was righteous indignation, it was handled the wrong way. So guess what? We got enough money to buy the air hockey table, and when it came time, I didn't even tell Pastor. I went and bought it, had it delivered, and then went in his office and said, yeah, we went, I went ahead and uh, paid for the air hockey table myself. So one 
indiscretion now turns into a lie. And now I'm lying uh, to the man that God has placed in my life. As old and crotchety as he was. <laughs> it didn't matter. We just talked about David and Saul, right? How did David honor Saul when, when, when Saul's throwing spears at him? He honors the king. Well, in my life, I did not honor the man that God had placed over my life. And so to be honest with you, I kept doing that. I just kept doing it for other things. We bought a new sound system. We bought air hockey table. We bought everything that I wanted to buy because I wanted to be in control. And I thought I was doing the true work of the gospel. Isn't that crazy? How the, the enemy can even take something that is, is, seems to be pure and right and contort it and twist it to a place where we can justify living a certain way. Well, here we go. A new pastor comes along. Pastor Walters retires. And a new pastor is brought into the church. I'm the youth pastor there. By recommendation of the board, um, the new pastor takes me on as the youth pastor. The old pastor is gone. But there's still a problem in my heart. I've already crossed that line of, of honoring the man that God has placed over me and lying and ultimately stealing misappropriation of funds and doing what I wanted to do with it. I didn't buy anything personal, but I bought things for the youth group. doesn't matter. I did something with it that I wasn't given authorization to do. Well, new pastor comes in. It was his intention the entire time to bring his, his own youth pastor in. Um, eventually he does. I'm let go from the church. By this time, I'm angry and I'm bitter. And... I can remember I just, I just bought this house, this flip house. And that's what I've done our whole, my whole life, my whole marriage at least, is buy houses that are in disrepair, live in them for two years, fix them up, turn around after two years and sell them. You can avoid capital gains tax. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty good flip. Um, for those of you who are interested, we can talk about, it, talk about house flipping later. Um, but I was in this house, and boy, did I bite off something I couldn't uh, handle. Boy, this house... The perimeter beams were rotten. You put yourself a ball on one corner and it would fly to the other corner without pushing it. I mean, it was like the floor was beat. Well, the whole entire upstairs was gutted and it was just stud frame. Downstairs, me and my family at that time, now I'm not in church ministry, there's bitterness already planted in my heart. We're living in one room. We've got plywood over one door. We've got a window unit in the window. My daughter Lily is, is young, and Lorelai has just been born. She's a baby. So it's me, my wife, Lorelai, and Lily. And we're living in one room in this dilapidated house. At this point, my wife didn't know if I could actually finish a house. This is the first flip that I ever did. And we're living in this dilapidated mess. Um, you talk about a recipe for relapse. I'm bitter against faith and religion um, and the, the church. And I'm living in a, a house where I bit off more than I can chew that I thought I would like gradually work on before we moved into it. Well, now we were forced to move into it because I lost my job. And we're living in this little room. And I can just imagine what my wife was thinking, you know, as she's never seen me do anything like this before. And... This house is in disrepair. There's literally no other room that's functional besides a toilet, um, a bath. We can put water in and take a bath and a, sh and a kitchen that's kind of partially done. So we're living in this little house. So I I'm in a place for a few months where I'm bitter, I'm angry, I'm frustrated. And I can remember just thinking in my head one evening, man, it'd be nice to smoke some weed right now. It'd be really great just to disappear for a minute. I mean, I deserve it stinking dead religion and the stupid church and I'm living in this house and I'm angry, I'm, I'm frustrated and bitter against people. I've got all this stuff I'm looking at that I don't think I can accomplish and I remember just thinking that thought. Man, it'd be nice to smoke some weed. Well, go to a place called Vision Video in uh, Cleveland, Texas, just outside of Tarkenton where I was youth pastor before. And in Cleveland, Texas, I go to Vision Video. Remember back in the day when you rented videos? I'm talking about like cassette videos, like, like you know, tapes. that You have to be kind and rewind or else they'll give you a fee. 
for not all you old folk are like, mm -hmm, I remember. That was Vision Video. You go through and you pick your title and you get a, probably two or three movies depending on how much you were going to watch. And you would go and you would pay for those. Well, I remember getting ready to get out of the car to go into Vision Video and I, I see these two nefarious characters outside sitting around their car. And I take one look at them, I'm saying, pot smokers. We know, we can spot them, right? You're like, meth addict, pot smoker, that's a crack addict. <laughs> right? We can kind of spot those things from a mile away. Well, I walk by these guys, you know, eyes kind of down and, hey man, so, I'm like, pot smokers. And I'm thinking in my head, this thought that's already swirling, and sure, it'd be nice to get high right now. It'd be nice to smoke a little weed. I mean, come on, man, just a little weed. Walked by him and said, you know what? If I come back outside and they're still here, I'm going to ask them if they can know where I can get, get some. So I walk around Vision Video. To be honest with you, I took a couple of extra loops around because I knew that I was standing on the precipice of, of, of sobriety, of years and years of sobriety. Now we're four... Five years outside of Teen Challenge, five years sober, clean, sober. And I'm looking at jumping over that ravine again. I'm getting ready to throw all that sobriety away and all my compromise that's going on in my head and the battle, my heart's pounding as I'm walking around Vision Video and I walk around one more time. Finally, I get all my selections. I, I cash out and I'm walking slowly toward the door and the whole time I know that if I pass them, I'm going to ask them. Heart's pounding, sweating a little bit, got my, my videos, and I walk right by them. I walk to my car door, and I open it, and I turn around, and I said, hey, you know where I can get some green? That huge crevasse of, of, of sobriety, that five-year gap, I just, I just dropped into it, just threw all that away, five years. They looked at me and said, you a cop? <laughs> Because at that time, I didn't look like a pothead. <laughs> I hadn't dove back into it. I said, no, I'm cool. Looked at me again and said, all right, follow me. We drove about three, four blocks away into a neighborhood. They went in. I'm sure took half of the bag, put it in their own bag, and came out with that short little sack that they gave me for $20 and said, here you go. But by this time, I didn't care. I wouldn't have cared if it was a joint. I was so nervous. I was scared, I, my heart was pounding, I was sweating a little bit, five years of sobriety down the toilet, and at this time, I know it's over. They come, give it to me, I just look at it for a second, hey, thanks, man, take off, go to my little shed in my backyard, and I, and I hide it in that little shed. And I go upstairs to my wife, and we're, we're in bed, and my heart's pounding, and I'm waiting for her to go to sleep so that when she goes to sleep, I can get up, I can go down to that shed, and I can roll up a joint. Well, she sits there and finally tosses and turns and goes to bed. And I creep out of bed and I go down to that little shed and I rolled up a joint. And there was a, a, a railroad track just a block away. I walked to that railroad track and I walked down that railroad track and I smoked five years of sobriety away. Now, some of you guys are thinking, man, it's just weed. Calm down. Well, <laughs> I beg to differ. For me, in, up in smoke went five years of sobriety. Went my conviction... All that that I live for, a, a two and a half year uh, youth pastorate in, in uh, Mandeville, Louisiana, a uh, little bit over a two year uh, past, uh, youth pastorate at Tarkin, in Tarkington, just outside of Houston, uh, a year internship, a year program at Sunrise, and here it is, walking down. You, you know what I felt that day? You know, there's a time in your life where you give in to temptation and you feel free. Let me tell you guys, that's an illusion. I, I, I felt free for a moment. I felt untethered from conviction. I felt untethered from religion and what everybody else wanted out of me and what was expected of me. And I felt free in that moment as I walked down that railroad track into darkness. I felt like all the weight and all that stuff was gone. But let me tell you, man, that's an illusion. There is there's pleasure in sin for a season, not just a night even. There's pleasure in, in unshackling yourself from religion, from conviction. But my friend, it does not last. It does not last long. 
I can remember walking down that track and letting it all go and then getting into a lifestyle of, of smoking weed, man. Smoking weed every day. I worked for a company called AeroCare Home Medical and we would go and deliver oxygen supplies, respiratory supplies, and BiPAPs, CPAPs, things like this. Well, at any point in my vehicle in the home, resp home respiratory solutions truck that I had, you could <laughs> lower the visor and see about five or six joints just lined up right there. Because I'd be on the back roads of Texas and I would finish the delivery, pull one out, smoke it. Pull one out, smoke it. All day, every day. That became my life. So much to the point where I got tired of trying to find it and I began to grow it. Had a little bit of my closet upstairs and had a light and, and, and the little grow there in my closet. One time my wife had some church friends over. Some of you might see where this is going. <laughs> and we're down hanging out in the living room I think it was Heather Land and, and maybe her brother or somebody else we're down hanging out in the living room just talking about old church times and youth pastor times well here comes my daughter Lorelai who's a little older now she's old enough to, to walk and, and to pick flowers oh, <laughs> Well, Lorelai, she grabs a big bundle of flowers for her mommy. Little did she know they really were flowers. <laughs> Technically. She gathered a big bundle of flowers. She's walking down the stairs, and I'm sitting in the living room with these other church folk, and I see J or Lorelai coming down the stairs. Does she? She does. She comes down with a bundle of marijuana. Ready to get... <laughs> Ready to give her mama some flowers. Well, I run as quick as I can. Hey, hey, hey. Grab those from her. And, and uh, I don't know if Heather and them, I, I've talked to them since, and I, I need to ask them if they ever knew what that really was. Um, I feel like they did. Um, that was me, man, now living this life, having come from faith, Christianity, to now having this secretive addiction where I'm smoking every, weed every day, all day. Just hiding, just running, just just running from conviction and all of it. Listen, man, I'm going to turn this into a three-part because the next next time I share, it gets a little heavier, and there, there's a lot involved um, with how bad addiction gets. But what I want to show you this morning is it, it doesn't start bad. You know, it, it, in my first stint at Teen Challenge, you know, it was... That was addiction, and it was ugly, and there were cr animalistic cravings, and it, was, and it brought me to a low place, but I didn't know low. I didn't know how low it could get when addiction takes everything from you. When you, you could care less about people, even those people you love the most in this world, and it can turn you into something else. Well, we eventually there... Um, finish that house, turn around and sell it. To be honest with you, part of finishing that house for me was telling, showing everybody that I could do it. I remember people when they looked at the house, they're like, oh, you bought a house. What are you going to do with it? <laughs> you, you sure? I, mean, I see the doubt all over them. Like, this dude done lost it. Bought this you know, rat trap and thinks he's going to fix it up. Well, man, half of me was just me trying to prove to the world um, as I took two pieces of drywall. Instead of untaping them, I had two pieces, and I would just chunk it up those stairs. And the whole time I was thinking, I'm going to show these people what I can do. <laughs> people ain't going to tell me what I can do. Late night, drilling, hanging, spackling, taping and bedding, laying tile, just after hours, angry remodeling. <laughs> But getting it done. I remember when I sold that house, I made 50 k $50,000 from fixing a house and selling it. I remember my chest puffing out and being like, now what? <laughs> All you people that said I couldn't do it. You know, more pride. Me against the world mentality. Like, you guys don't think I can do it. I'm going to do it. You guys, remove me from your church. I... I don't need you. Now, deep in addiction, here I am with this pride that is welled up. 
we sell that house, I'm emboldened to live the life that I'm living. I'm emboldened just to keep doing what I'm doing. But how many knows it usually doesn't stay there? Addiction for people like us, residential care cats like us, usually escalates to a point where it's completely out of control. Let's bow our heads. God, we love you and I thank you for who you are. God, I, we look, I look back at my own life and I just pray you put it on display today. All my arrogance, my bitterness, my frustration, my deception. Lord, we all have our own story and each and every one of us can relate to something or another. God, I pray you would teach us as we, as we give our lives here, as we lay our lives down, that we're laying it all down. Our pride, our arrogance, our, our addiction, our justifications, all the things that we carry. God, help us to start truly afresh and anew as we surrender to you. God, would you go with these guys today? Keep them safe, Lord, at the thrift and on lawn care and uh, everywhere we go. Lord, would you be with us, protect us, and keep us and until we meet again in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a good day.